Hi, Year 10, and welcome back to Act 5, Scene 3. Um, this scene starts in Macbeth's castle, so we've gone from almost the battlefield um, back into the castle in Scotland, and we've got a doctor and some attendants here. Um, Macbeth starts the speech. I'm not sure what to write the capacity for this, so we're just in Macbeth's castle, but it does say that on the top of page 88. Right, Macbeth starts, which is great, because we haven't heard from him um, uh, at all in Act 5. This is the first time he comes back in. Bring me no more reports, let them fly all. So here he says, I don't want to know about anything else, about the English army's movements. I don't want to know any updates. I don't want to know about Scotland. He wants to know absolutely nothing here. So this imperative, bring me no more reports, just shows his confidence. And ultimately, he doesn't want to know because he doesn't really need to know. Because in his mind, the prophecy has told Macbeth that he is invincible, that no one can kill him. And no one will take his castle until a forest moves to his castle, which is just uh, impossible in Macbeth's mind to happen. So he's invincible. He's like, what's the point in telling me what they're doing? I'm fine. And he says that here. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. So I can't feel any fear because that's not going to happen. What's the boy, Malcolm? And again, this mode of address calls him a boy. So not experienced enough to actually pose a threat. This mode of address... He thinks Malcolm is inexperienced, young, not a threat. So what's that boy? Was he not born of a woman? So again, he was born of a woman, so he's not a problem. The spirits that know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth, no man that's born of a woman shall ever have power upon thee. So no one can kill him. No one can kill Macbeth, who was born of a woman. So he feels completely, completely fine. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt, nor shake with fear. So this metaphor that he can't be shaken with fear shows that he wholeheartedly believes in the witch's prophecy which shows he believes in the supernatural and that he can be saved okay a servant comes in he says the devil damn thee black thou cream-faced loon where dost thou that goose look so a servant has come in and he basically says why do you look so scared that a white face is what he means there and goose so just why are you scared because he feels no fear at all. And the servant tries to say here, there is 10,000, and he's talking about the English army, which Macbeth doesn't care about. He says, geese, villain. So like, cuts him off, says, don't be scared. Soldiers, sir, go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers patch, death of thy soul, those linen cheeks of thine are counsels to fear. What soldiers wave face? Just you don't need to worry about this. Stop. The English force, so please you, take thy face hence. So I don't want to see this. I don't need to know about it. Satan, I am sick at heart when I behold Satan. I say this push will cheer me ever or de deceit me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honour, love, obedience, troops of friends. I must not look to have, but in their stead, curse is not loud but deep, mouth honour, breath which the poor heart would fain deny, and dare not. Satan. So, um, you've got a, a note actually that I've put on the side, on the top of page 89 there, it compares the opening lines of Shakespeare's sonnet 73, which you can see, um, just in that he's lived his life, he accepts what has happened, um, and now he wants to, to talk to Satan, who is a, a doctor here. Right. What is your gracious pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armour. So even though he feels invincible, we get more imperatives here. Um, give me my armour. Because we can link back almost this cyclical idea 
which is in a cycle. So we've done full circle here that Macbeth is a soldier, a war hero, and he acts this way. He is a ruthless fighter. And now that he wants his armour, it kind of shows us that he still has that ability within him. Jason says, tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses. Scour the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me my armour. How does your patient, doctor? So more imperatives. Give my armour. Hang those that talk of fear. So hang anyone who's scared or says that I'm not going to win this war. So again, uh, ruthless. He's very cold. And we've got this other cold thing here that he says. It's interrogative. How does your patient... So who is his patient? Well, that is Lady Macbeth, who is quite detached from, from her. Right. Not so sick, my lord, and she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. And she's troubled here. This sleep idea of being troubled, which links to Act 2, Scene 2, with the, the guilt. Um, this was Macbeth in Act 2, Scene 2. But now in this scene, this is now Lady Macbeth. With the whole sleep no more that Macbeth says. So it's now Lady Macbeth who can't sleep. So their roles have reversed as time has gone on. So Macbeth seems to have hardened, whereas Lady Macbeth finally is dealing with that guilt. Cure her of that. <laughs> As if it's that simple, Macbeth says to the doctor, just cure her of that. Another imperative, make her better. <laughs> Which, again, is harder than it sounds. Once thou not minister to a mind disease, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon her heart. So there must be a simple antidote. So simple antidote, antidote to cure her must be, must exist. Of sure, of sure, of course. Even though he suffered in the same ways, he now is like, no, nope, it must be fine. You can cure her. There in the patient must minister to himself. Throw physic to the dogs. Oh, none of it. Come, put my armour on. Give me my staff. Satan, send out. Doctor, the thanes fly from me. Good, we're there. So just more imperative to get ready for the war. Come, sir, dispatch. If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land, find her disease and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb sign or what purgative drug would scour these English hens? Hearest thou of them? So just cure her. It's quite um, hysterical in terms of just cure her with anything and anything. So potentially hysterical, cure her with anything um, you can at all. Hi, my good lord. Your royal preparation makes us hear something. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till burn and forest come to dunce a name. So this rhyming couplet here also highlights that Macbeth is now internalising speaking the witch's prophecy in his own words. The doctor says, were I from Dunsinane away and clear, prophet again should hardly draw me here. And that is the end of Act 5, Scene 4. Scene 3, sorry, I don't know why I said Scene 4, jeez. Right, that was at the end of page 90. Perfect. So, the doctor just ends there with, essentially, I would never come here again, even for the money, <laughs> because it's just crazy, and that he knows he can't really cure Lady Macbeth because what she's done needs to cure itself. Right, make sure you've got the annotations. Um, it's important to see what Mef Macbeth, this whole scene, which I just put at the end, and you can put at the beginning, is this scene highlights Macbeth's state, or I'm going to put a slash there, frame of mind, 
in terms of what he's expecting and how he feels towards the English army coming and the battle that is ahead. Right, perfect. See you tomorrow for the next one. Bye.